My name is Dr. Mark Algie. This is a manual muscle testing and chiropractic teaching video. In this video, we'll be discussing manual muscle testing, manual muscle testing combined in assessing primitive reflexes, asymmetrical tonic neck reflexes, utilizing manual muscle testing to identify normal and abnormal responses, balance testing, vibration, we're going to demonstrate how to separate a primary from a secondary subluxation. We're going to demonstrate these topics on our four patients. One of our patients is Dr. Shireen, a fellow chiropractor, Julie, Brittany, and Dr. Parisi, also a fellow chiropractor. From Dr. Shireen, we will learn that chiropractic care can improve coordination, eye-hand timing, power and performance. From Julie, we will learn that chiropractic care can improve balance. Chiropractic care can also equalize the sensation that the patient feels from the left to the right side of their body while using the tuning fork and the vibration that it creates. From Brittany, we'll learn that chiropractic care can de-stress patients, something all of us should know. Do you feel calmer? Yeah, I do. That's because we can activate the parasympathetics, calm down the nervous system, and decrease the sensitivity the patient feels to internal and external stimuli. And lastly, with Dr. Parisi, I'm going to demonstrate using manual muscle testing to evaluate primitive reflexes. In this example, the gallant reflex. We're gonna combine it with manual muscle testing to determine where and how to adjust in the low back or pelvis area. I'm also going to attempt to demonstrate how a bilateral psoas could be an indication of a occiput subluxation. This video segment is taken from Dr. Shireen's previous visit. In that visit, I adjusted her occiput, her sacrum, and gave her distraction. But I also had her balance and dribble her basketball to see what it did with her coordination. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> that's amazing. She got it. Now let's get into her current case. Doc, how are you? Amazing. How was your last, uh, how were you after your last session? Uh, everything turned on. Like, um, I was making the majority of my shots. I had a lot more control. I could dribble with my left. Um, flowing. Go. <laughs> My coordination was on again, like even when I'm singing songs on the radio, everything is just flowing, my timing is right. I remember I told you like I never had good timing like in dance classes when I was young and everything and my timing is like on. So all with that octopus adjustment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we check your balance? Yes. And so one other thing also, um, when I would start to like feel like this side was getting a little bit weaker, mm -hmm. I would press right here and then I would have full control over it again. Okay. So we should check it again. Yeah. How excited were you that everything worked? I, oh, I started crying. I was shooting the ball. It was going in. I was dribbling. Everything was like I had like control over my body, and I just broke down. Like I just started crying. And I was on the basketball court, so I was like, <laughs> I was, like, walking away, like no, no crying, no crying. That's great. And I, and I was able to work with uh, a really cool trainer too, uh, Rob Valentine. And he was super patient with me because I was telling him, yeah, I basically just turned on like this side of my body. Um, I realized that I shoot left-handed. I had no idea that I did that because I'm a two-handed shooter. And so my left hand is dominant and that's why I was missing so much because my left hand is my dominant hand. So your shots were off. Yeah. I was like telling him at the beginning, I was like, oh yeah, I'm a shooter. And then like, I was not a shooter. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not lying, I promise. So now. In the room with us as a fellow chiropractor, I happen to be teaching a chiropractic continuing educational class for the day. So you'll see me talking to other doctors who are behind the scenes. So Dr. Cino, so you know, for her background, she's been having balance issues and coordination issues. She's a basketball player. She wants to go pro. So the doc's been really, really, really freezing cold. What are the signs and symptoms? Oh, they're so much better. Look at you. Yeah, wow. my feet are not freezing on this floor. She's been ice cold. Her hands and feet have been ice cold every visit. So two visits ago, put her on a bunch of anti-inflammatories, some uh, two liquid products, I think two pills. Her heat is much better in her hands and feet, which tells us that her microcirculation is better, and also that means that the brain, because the brain is also an extremity. Mm -hmm. Hands and feet and brain are mm -hmm. all extremities. So her brain should be working better coordination. 
Uh, I couldn't get her balance in the beginning. Her balance is much better. It took us a while, but it finally figured out it was her octopus that was out. All right, doctor, let's check your balance. Back you go, heel to toe. Flawless. On your back. I, I would not pass the sobriety test anymore. <laughs> this is what Dr. Shreen is referring to. In her previous visits, her balance was poor and unsteady. Notice how her legs are shaking and she's falling to the right. Basic manual muscle testing 101. With the patient in the supine position and her head in the neutral position, all of her muscles should test strong. This is normal. I'm going to place the muscles that should be facilitated in the color green or strong, strong is the layperson's term. When muscles are inhibited or weak, I'm going to place them in the color red. So this will be our format for the rest of this video. Green meaning facilitated or strong, red meaning inhibited or weak. So we're checking our patient's legs for strength. She's missing strength in her legs, which tells us something probably in her cervical spine is still out. This is a glute medius test. We're gonna check the right one, push out. Doctor, push out. Maybe the way I slept last night. Bend this knee, don't let me pull. That one's rock solid, that's good, that's what we want. Try this one. So those are good. Doc, turn your head right for me. Don't let me pull. Try again, Doc. Go. So that's not what we want. Head straight up. Push towards me. Jules, feel free to move around and be comfortable. You're good. Good. Pull towards your hip. Good. Push towards the door. So she has upper body strength and lower body weakness. Now let's say I'm muscle testing a patient and they have one muscle that's inhibited or weak. So in this example, we have a right rectus femoris muscle that's inhibited. If that's inhibited, I might think that individual muscle has a strain to it or an injury, causing it to have a loss of strength and power. Or in this picture in the middle, a patient has a strain or injury to the right pectoralis. Or lastly, to the picture on the right, where a patient has an injury to their right latissimus dorsi muscle. So once again, the muscles in green are strong or facilitated, and the muscles in red are inhibited or weak. So if we have a unilateral weakness, we're going to make the assumption that the patient has an injury. However, when we see bilateral weakness, so the same muscles being inhibited on both sides of the bodies, in this example, bilateral rectus femoris weakness, or bilateral pectoralis weakness or bilateral latissimus dorsi weakness. In these examples, we're going to look for something in the central spine. So some type of subluxation or fixation that's in the center. And by doing that, if we can correct that issue, hopefully we can get those both of those muscles to facilitate. I wanna pause for a moment and point something out. When we have a unilateral or a bilateral weakness, it doesn't mean that the muscle has a pathological injury. What I'm discussing are muscles that are normal and healthy and work properly, but that there's something inhibiting their strength. So I'm not talking about some type of pathologic disorder, not Parkinson's or a muscle wasting disease or myasthenia gravis. I'm talking about healthy, normal muscles that are inhibited and that we as chiropractors or healthcare professionals can get to turn on and facilitate properly. So because of this pattern that the doctor has with lower body inhibition or weakness and upper body facilitation or strength, I'm going to go look for a central spine structure. In her case, I'm going to go look at C1 first. We're gonna go look at C1 and see what impact that has on her. We're doing great. So usually we check the doc's C1 to see if it facilitates all her lower extremities. But her last visit, it was her occiput. Push up for me. Oh, that's rock solid. Try again. That's rock solid. Push up. Good. Push up. You got a three to five second window to do the test. Push up. Great. Push up. Doc, we're gonna check, we're gonna do the same thing on you. So I'm gonna mobilize C1 again. 
I'm going to do something a little awkward. I'm going to give her a little pinch. Push up for me. Now, if she goes weak after that pinch, push up. It means it's not a primary problem. So now we're going to go check her occiput again. Her occiput's what we checked last week, and that made the biggest change on her. So. I'm going to pinch again, Doc. Push up. So here she stays facilitated. All her muscles are strong. Push up. Just push up. So we're going to do her octoput again. Don't let me pull. Head right. Don't let me pull. Okay. All right, let's recap what just happened. So initially, Dr. Shring came in, and she stated that when she placed pressure on the left side of her upper cervical spine, her occiput, her C1, her C2 area, that it facilitated her upper left torso and everything started to work again. So this caused me to go to her upper cervical spine in combination with her manual muscle testing, which showed upper body strength and lower body weakness. And I performed mobilization on that C1. I went and checked her muscles and they all facilitated. So this is normal. However, I went back and mobilized it again. And this time I pinched her. Now the pinch test is designed to separate a primary from a secondary issue. When I tested her muscles again, they were inhibited. So this tells me that this is not a priority. It's not an area of importance. I went back and mobilized her occiput, performed the pinch test, and rechecked her muscle strength and her muscles facilitated. So this is a priority. It's an area of importance that we're going to treat. So the pinch test, once again, allows us to separate a primary from a secondary area of dysfunction so that we can concentrate our care on primary issues. I'm gonna segue for a moment and introduce you to my colleague and mentor, Dr. Michael Allen. Dr. Michael Allen was my preceptor doctor at the making of this video 21, 22 years ago. Dr. Allen is one of the first chiropractic neurologists to graduate from the CARIC program. I'm going to leave his links to his YouTube channel in the description below. And let me introduce to you where this concept of the pinch test came from. Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Allen, author of the books, What Your Brain Might Say If It Could Speak, and Receptor-Based Solutions, Functional Neurology Every Doctor Should Know. I'd like to talk today about a priority sequence that you can use in your practice this priority sequence has been very helpful to me and I'd like to share it with you that perhaps you'll be able to put it together with your patients and uh, understand when to fix things and how to fix them. This concept came up when I was working with Dr. Deal, Sheldon Deal in his office back in 1977. He would bring in a patient and we would work on this patient for sometimes several hours at a time. We call it a Wednesday night physical. We brought a patient in at eight o'clock and we'd sometimes work until two in the morning to get the, the, the techniques understood and it helped us understand a lot of new information. One of the things was when to fix a priority and when to, when to leave another indicator alone. So this priority sequence is this. When a muscle is tested and found to be conditionally facilitated, you might think it's fine and go on. But if you pinch the patient in certain areas and the muscle stays strong, no problem. If you pinch and the muscle weak, weakens or it becomes conditionally inhibited, at that point you think, hmm, there's a problem there, but I'm not gonna address it. So at that point, you'd have the person therapy localized and test the muscle and have them take a deep breath and hold it, and then you can pinch. And if those uh, indicators remain facilitated, that says this is a primary problem, go ahead and fix it. And any secondary issues could either go away or become conditionally ready to be examined and, and treated. Why not simply adjust both segments, both the occiput and the C1? The reason for that is there's something called metabolic capacity. We do not wish to exceed the metabolic capacity of patients, their neurons. Metabolic capacity is the ability for neurons to generate adenosine triphosphate, make their energy, and to recover from stimulation. If the nerve is overstimulated, which can be done with a chiropractic adjustment, if you exceed the metabolic capacity of the neuron, it will release the neurotransmitter glutamate, which goes into the surrounding tissues. It hits something called an MNDA receptor, and in the process, it can stimulate other neurons. 
in an unhealthy manner which can be detrimental to the patient's well-being. Always remember we wish to stay on the lower side of chiropractic care or treatment and we want to always do a little less than the patient can handle. When we do too much, we will make the patient spacey and dizzy. Doc, what kind of, what kind of practice do you have? Just family practice. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to do a lot of videos on uh, TMJ today. Thank you. How did you hear about me, by the way, for our class today? You know, I went to the chiropractic website and I wanted a live, a live seminar. So we're going to do some, come in, Doc. We're going to do some little uh, stimulation of rocks to put. Doc, come on in. Come in and stand over here. You're totally fine. You stand right here. So, Doc, you're going to bring your left ear to your left shoulder. Squeeze. Good. Squeeze. Squeeze for me. Gotcha. So I always check patients after their adjustments to see if they get warm. She did not get warm on this adjustment. Push up from your back. Great. Push up. Good. Push out. Good. Push up. Okay. When Dr. Shereen was first muscle tested, all of her lower torso muscles were inhibited. Now they're facilitated. This is normal. This is a good sign. You want to go run and jog for a little bit and see how you feel? Mm -hmm. Rock solid, mm -hmm. huh? On your back. Actually, Doc, bounce for me a few times. I want you to stretch your system. And now I want you on your back. Go. Perfect. Again. Perfect. Push out. Wonderful. Go. Good. Push up for me. So this stimulates, simulates as if they're walking. Push up. And if she goes weak on that adjustment, we'll go look at her feet, her ankles, her low back. Okay, I'm going to check all your strong reflexes. You ready? Push out for me. So, <laughs> okay, there's our first fail. When I stroke Dr. Shreen's left foot, performing the left flexor withdrawal reflex, she should have had facilitation of her right gluteus medius, and she does not. So this is abnormal. Try again. That should be strong. Manual muscle testing 101. Remember, with the head in the neutral position and the patient supine, all of the patient's muscles should test strong. They should be facilitated. That's normal. However, when I stroke a patient's foot or do a tap on a knee, normal signals should show up. And one of the normal signals is actually inhi inhibition. There are muscles that should become inhibited. That's normal. Now that might seem a little confusing. Muscles need to become inhibited when it's appropriate. In this picture here, when I stroke the patient's left foot, it should have caused right glute med activation or facilitation, and it did not. And this is why it's abnormal. That one's fine. That's weird. <laughs> So I always make certain to massage patients' feet because uh, feet that are out of place send abnormal signals into the spinal cord into the brain. And then the brain sends out abnormal signals to muscles. And so this is where you have coordination problems if feet are out. So. I know, most uncomfortable adjustment we did. Push out, Doc, go. Okay, that facilitated and normalized that reflex is what we want. All right, so let's recap. I adjusted Dr. Shireen. I had her reperform her balance test. It was still good, so that's a good sign. Then I had her stress her system. I had her jump and bounce, and we got her back on the table. 
Now, during the next portion of her manual muscle testing exam and repeating those initial muscles that tested weak, they are still testing strong. They're still facilitated, and that's a good sign. I also pounded on the bottom of her feet to simulate walking, and she passed that exam, so that's great. Here, when I performed the flexor withdrawal reflex of her left foot, she should have had facilitation or strength of her right glute med. She did not. So that was actually normal before I had her stress her system. I want to use some analogies to demonstrate why it's important to stress your patients during their session. A car battery might look normal and it might be it's the normal 12 volts until you place the battery under a load. When you place the battery under a load, that's when its problems start to show up, that it doesn't have enough reserves of energy, the current and demands cannot be met. So it's actually a bad battery, but on its surface, it looks normal. When we do the basic muscle testing of the patient after care on the table, much like this battery, they might look normal until we stress their system and place it under a load. To be a little repetitive, but to make certain that the lesson sticks, imagine a car that's in the shop. The mechanic looks it through and under the computer testing, it looks normal but that's when it's not being stressed. Then when you drive the car and place it under a load or run it through its dynamic testing phase, this is where problems will show up. Patients are much like vehicles in this aspect. So stressing a patient, putting their system under a load between portions of your care is a good idea if you're looking for those subclinical issues that are not immediately apparent. I know, most uncomfortable adjustment we do. Push up, Doc, go. Okay, that facilitated and normalized that reflex is what we want. Try this one, push out. Great. Push up. Good. Push up. Good. Yesterday after playing, um, push up, Doc. my fibula was kind of achy a little bit. Which one? This one. Okay, we'll check it. Push up. So far, she's doing 100%. Doc, push towards me. Good. Push towards the door. Great. Push towards the door. Good. Push up. So we went from foot to foot, side to side, and then we went from lower to upper, and now we're going from upper to lower. So these are all the reflexes that should be normal. And if they are, it tells us that we've gotten the nervous system working the way it should be. Push towards me. Good. Now, Doc, I'm gonna check all your inhibitory reflexes. I know you're gonna feel a little weak, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't feel weak. Push up. So these should all be weak, even though she's gonna try hard. Go! <laughs> nobody likes these tests, push up. Because nobody wants to feel weak. Push towards me. Push towards the door. You are trying, right? Push towards me. I know she is. Push towards the door. Okay, Doc, go. You're doing great, actually. Go stretch yourself for a second, and then we're gonna check your low back stuff.